Please welcome back to the stage my esteemed college colleague, Heather Clancy. Hey. Good morning again. Chris, come on out here. Come on out here. So those of you who follow my writing um, know that I'm a little bit of a geek. In fact, um, Verge is my little sweet, sweet spot conference. I spend a lot of time thinking about how technology can play a role in helping us meet sustainability, sustainability goals or sustainable business practices. But yet, there's this whole dilemma of the impact that it has on our, our uh, world as we, as we get there. So our topic is connecting the next billion, which is a pretty cool topic, actually. But we, if, when you think about it, it's all these ride-sharing services and all these Internet of Things analytics projects that are going in, into place, all of this promise that we have. Um, and here to debate this topic with me a little bit is Chris Libri from HP. And um, Chris, your official title, I'm, I'm going to be official here, is Senior Director of Living Progress Strategy and Communications for Hewlett Packard. Now, I'm pretty sure that people know who HP is, but what is Living Progress? Well, we launched uh, Living Progress in 2013 uh, in an effort to connect better uh, the longstanding work that HP has done in global citizenship, or CSR, and our business strategy. Um, as probably many of you know, uh, Meg Whitman and her leadership team have been driving a, a business turnaround at HP. Um, and that turnaround is, is going uh, according to plan. We're going to separate into two companies uh, by the end of uh, this year, uh, one focused more on uh, consumer-oriented products like printers and PCs and tablets. Uh, and that's going to be called HP Inc. Uh, the other company, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, is going to be focused more on our larger customers and data centers, uh, enterprise services or consulting, and uh, software. And so uh, really what Meg wanted to do is she wanted to leverage uh, the work that we do in CSR and global citizenship to help drive business results. And so by, by linking those two better together, uh, we're trying to create a better future through our actions and innovations. We've dedicated HP uh, in its entirety towards solving some of society's toughest challenges. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what, what living progress is all about. OK, so the, the dilemma that we're facing here, um, you know, Internet of Things, which is a term that, frankly, I've been writing about for probably at least 15 years, scary but true. Um, General Electric is putting tons of money into this, right? They have some specific services that they're using to drive better business practices throughout their business, predictive analytics, big data. Uh, we've heard a lot about mobile banking services in places like Africa and all of these great, um, great ideas that, that get talked about here, right, that, that could help touch and empower so many people around the world. So what is our dilemma? You know, this is great stuff. This is so much opportunity. But why is this a huge challenge. Tell me what the dilemma is. Well, it's, in its entirety, it's not a dilemma at its, at its highest level. Of course, we want to encourage the Internet of Things. We want people to be connected, and hence the, the title of this talk, Connecting the Next Billion uh, People. Uh, but the issue with it is, is the amount of data that we're creating uh, is enormous. And so uh, you know, just in the next 10 minutes, and I think we have about 10 minutes to go, <laughs> uh, we're going to create more data than in all of human history up to the year 2003. Um, now, I don't know why they picked 2003, but uh, it kind of works. Um, it took them that long to do the calculations. Maybe. Uh, uh, you know, and, and there's lots, of, lots more information about that uh, that I can share, the projections of the kind of data that we're going to create uh, over the next few years uh, means that we're going to be 50 times more uh, data rich uh, by the year 2020 than we are today. And so, uh, you know, we look at that as uh, definitely uh, not only a challenge, but an opportunity for our business. And when you add to that the fact that uh, there are going to be three billion more middle class consumers around the world by 2030, uh, which is, again is terrific for economic empowerment and the development of societies around the world, uh, we're going to need to find new ways of providing those people with data uh, that are paradigm changing in terms of uh, the energy and space requirements. So w let's talk about the energy requirements first, because like, if you think about it, connecting, some, connecting a region in, uh, pick, a, pick any emerging nation, you got to put uh, primarily well, wi wireless communications infrastructure in place. And that requires diesel, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, that's pretty much the option that, that, that the companies have to connect 
cell towers to those mobile devices that everyone's putting in their hands. So what, what are our, our actual resource constraints? I mean, is it, is it energy? Is it, you know, can you, can you kind of go through the, sure. the sort of the main concerns that you're dealing with? I mean, you're putting a lot of uh, cloud computing services into place. What are the things that HP, as an example, is looking at carefully as it prepares to handle that data? What, what is it worried about? Well, you know, it's, it's not for nothing that uh, at the Clinton Global Initiative in September, you know, uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton named energy poverty as one of the four major issues facing the world. Um, and today, uh, the public cloud uh, already uses as much energy as the country of Japan. So that's problem number one. If we're going to have a 50 times increase in the amount of data that we need to uh, provide societies, we're going to need to be able to do that in, in new and different ways. Um, the other big issue with the public cloud, uh, which doesn't really get quite as much attention, is space. Uh, the amount of space that's required to house conventional data centers uh, is enormous. And already it's estimated that we're going to need 8 to 12 million more servers to handle the data increases. Mm -hmm. And that would occupy a space the length of Manhattan if you laid those data centers end to end. Um, and as a native New Yorker, I don't really like that idea. Um, I don't see Manhattan being turned over to data centers. But, um, but in any event, you know, it's, it's, a real, it's a real issue, not only the energy requirement, but the bricks and mortar and the space requirement uh, to be able to meet um, our burgeoning data needs. Now, is that particular to, uh, when you think about it, are you thinking about the existing sort of established economies that you're dealing with, or the, do you have a different strategy for either? I mean, what, what's, what's the, the proposition for retrofitting versus new development? I think the strategies are, are quite similar, because I think the strategies that will work in developing economies are going to help uh, the advancement of the developed economies. I think the kinds of energy improvements that we're starting to target um, and the space improvements are going to be uh, useful in both situations. I think the other thing that's important about this is getting um, away from the idea of the enormous centralized data center right. and to a more distributed approach, uh, more of a mesh of computing. Uh, and I can talk more about that. That's that's something that HP is, yeah, is doing a lot of work of, about. Yeah, I want an example of. I mean, that. I want an example of how that. You know, this is all theoretical, right? But how does this, how do you make this happen? How do you get get to a better place? Well, some of it's theoretical. Some of the some of the technologies are there. And and really, I want to I want to come back to this idea that you know putting purpose at the heart of our strategy was all a, a major part of this. Being able to link. Um, the fact that you know, we want to create living progress, we want to create uh, improvements uh, that are going to meet the needs of the future uh, is, is absolutely central to some of these innovations that I'm going to talk about. So one that's already in place is our Project Moonshot, right. which is a, uh, a server that's a cartridge-based server that uh, uses what How we big? call, it's about the size of a paperback book. OK, so it's 80% uh, more space efficient. So back to that issue of space. But even more uh, importantly, it's uh, up to 89% more energy efficient than a standard uh, x86 server. And so we've been able to achieve those improvements by using what we call system on a chip, or in true HP fashion, the acronym SOC. Um, everything at HP is an acronym. Um, and so this system on a chip approach has enabled us to really specialize within in those uh, moonshot cartridges uh, in order to optimize their efficiency, right? So those are already on the market. There are uh, a number of these uh, moonshot cartridges for specific uh, business purposes, uh, and they work in a, in a tremendously more efficient way. Um, so that's one, one approach. And then we're working on a longer range approach which um, we call the machine, um, and uh, the machine, the machine quote, which yeah. sounds truly uh, <laughs> a little scary, a little actually. ominous. Yeah, yeah, but actually, it it uses it builds on that system on a chip approach in order to um, leverage a couple of other technologies that I th think are really cool. So this is work that's come to, come out of HP Labs. Um, one of those technologies is photonics, the use of light instead of uh, wires to transmit information within the computer. Um, and so uh, micro millimeter sized lasers 
transmitting information between the, the chips and the, uh, the, the processors within uh, a computer. Um, the other is uh, a really cool technology called Memristor. And this is a, a, a more chemical-based storage system that's non-volatile. What does that mean? Um, I'm not a te technical person, so it kind of helps, because I can actually hopefully put this in non-technical language. Non-volatile memory means it doesn't require any energy for storage. So it's not subject to um, mm -hmm. blackouts or brownouts. It's not subject to any kind of disturbance due to electricity issues, energy poverty mm -hmm. in, uh, in CGI terms. Right. Um, and then it's also uh, many, many times uh, more efficient. So, you know, one of the things, though, I, I wonder, because I am so on and I am so all about new technology and new features, but why can't, can you do this in software, right? Because we have this huge electronic waste problem. Like, that's a great approach. It's much smaller, but what are we going to do with the stuff that we've taken out? Why can't we work towards, you know, sort of a better uh, use of what we have already? I think I read that um, the number of, smartphones that will be shipped that were that, and bought in like 2017 that are refurbished, right? So phones that have got, found a second life, it will double by 2017 compared with last year to so something like 120 million units. This was a figure that was out yesterday. Why can't we work towards more refurbishment, more mm. like let's get this stuff updated and con perpetually updated in software? Well, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of answers to that question. First of all, we already do. I mean, you know, HP's been a pioneer in terms of recycling printing supplies. Mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody in this room has had the experience of sending back your printer cartridge to, to HP, and we have a closed loop system for those. They get made into new cartridges. So that's that's pretty cool. I think on the electronic side, that's also something where we've pioneered um, the, the recycling of e-waste, not only in developed markets, but in developing markets. Yeah. So we opened the first uh, e-waste recycling center um, in, uh, in Nairobi right. uh, in Kenya. And so there's been some great movement in that direction too. I do think that the split of the companies is also going to help us uh, tremendously in this area because as you look at a company that's going to be producing uh, you know, more consumer-oriented products, tablets, PCs, Smartphone, yeah. it, it, smartphones, those kind of things, watches, I mean, wearable technologies, those things are going to need to be recycled. And, and that group really takes seriously the idea of a circular economy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I just kind of changing gears and, and, and not making this, you know, entirely an HP ad. I mean, you know, there, there are a lot of companies, I think, that, you know, stand out for me as having identified, you know, this central issue, be it energy and space for our enterprise business mm -hmm. or, you know, materials usage for our ink business. They identify those material issues and they really go after them. So, you know, uh, Unilever and you know, the concentration of their products or their you know, really, uh, I think, amazing attempts to get consumers to behave differently uh, and you know, take shorter showers. Uh, you know, Nike right. and materials and you know, their fly net technology where they've really tried to reduce you know, the amount of um, stuff that goes into their products because they know that materials is the, is the key issue for them. And uh, you know, I was just at dinner last night with, with uh, uh, Jim Hanna from, from Starbucks, and we were talking about how you know, the supply chain and ethical treatment of the coffee growers, I mean, that's their material issue. So I think this, this whole idea of thinking about purpose at the heart of sustainability is what's driving, I think, a lot of great movement, and you know, particularly, as I say, at HP, in those two different directions for the two new companies. Okay, Lauren, I think we have time for one quick question from Sidebar. What, what yeah. do you got? Is HP using the Internet of Things technology to look at solving water issues at all? Well, we were talking in the sidebar a little bit about how HP is using our big data technology to help with um, biodiversity issues. So in a sort of indirect way, yes. Uh, water, not specifically at the moment, but I would, I would highlight a collaborative program we're doing with Conservation International. Um, with apologies to Carter Roberts. Um, we're doing that uh, with CI, it's called HP Earth Insights, uh, and that program is, is all targeted at helping uh, identify at-risk uh, species in rainforests around the world using big data. All right, so um, call to action, right? Mm -hmm. 
what, what, what should the people in this room be thinking about as they use the Internet of Things, et, et cetera, to address their, their opportunities? Right. I, I mean, I think I've alluded to that. I think it's putting purpose at the heart of strategy is my number one call to action. I think these examples of how HP has transformed itself and has reunited itself around the technology that will be the machine or around circular economy. I think that's a, a great example of doing that. I think Nike, Starbucks, and, uh, and Unilever also stand out in my mind, as many other companies, I'm sure, in this room. OK, so short. We have to be uh, done now. But thank you, Chris, for, you, for being with us today. All right. Thanks. Thank you.